peanut shop on Main Street. It was located right next to Lowe's Theater, which is now the Civic Theater. Uh, they had a little um, statue that was made like a peanut, and it had legs on it, which was the peanut man, and he had a silk, uh, black uh, silk top hat on. Mr. Peanut is still there, and so is that great aroma. If you were within uh, maybe 20 feet of the store, you got the smell. Well, we, we had fans in the, in, in the windows to throw the smell out in the street. The smell was fantastic. You could smell them, these roasting peanuts uh, out on the, the main sidewalk. You didn't even have to go in the shop to get the benefit of, of the whiff. Each store also aimed to create the most alluring display windows. The idea was to get people talking about these incredible displays, to get you downtown and into their stores. I worked for the May Company during its glory days when the Christmas windows were planned and worked on for months previous to the grand event, when they had a fabulous budget for display, when they had, oh Lord, the display department must have had perhaps upward of 20, 25 people in it. Pallies used to change their windows on Thursday nights, and people would stand on the street and wait till the curtains were put up to see what the new windows were going to be. They had such excitement, and there was that was a big thing, too, to see who was doing what in the windows. We spent hours on end down there, just sometimes just looking through after she would do the shopping. We would look, and what was fascinating is to see the difference in the displays, the window display. That was an art to watch these uh, creative, talented people change the different displays uh, from, you know, from season, based on the season. The care and attention given the windows was a reflection of the care you found inside as a customer. I remember the, um, probably the salespeople the most, because they were nice and they were, um, you know, there was, there was a lot about customer service before we called it that. It was a softer time in life. Maybe that's the best way that I can identify it. It was the so-called Eisenhower years where things were sort of laissez-faire. Service was paramount for a store to survive downtown, something you don't see much of today. But I've been in some stores that they could care less for you or not. They keep looking at their watch. You know, they're just doing some time and grabbing a few bucks an hour. And some of that's lost because downtown Cleveland, boy, I'll tell you, those girls, guys, uh, they take care of you. You wanted some trousers? Come on, try this. You want some suit? Oh, they tailored a suit to you. If it didn't, it was too short or whatever, you know? So uh, some of that was important, I think. People who waited on you in stores generally were very accommodating. Most of them were pleasant. Many of them were very patient. An example would be if a customer asked you for directions to another department, you were not allowed to point or to tell them it was your duty to escort them to that area and to introduce them to someone in that particular department. Stores like Halley's were remarkable. I mean, Halley's had uniform doormen. You walked into it, and, and you did get that type of service. If you asked where something was, you were taken there. It, it was very personal. The elevator operators had uniforms, the doorman had uniforms, and my husband being a delivery man, they had uniforms too. And Sterling's uniforms were always the blue, and they had the logo on them and their name, and Halley's were always green and red, which Halley's colors were green. It was their identity while they were working. Maybe all this attention from the clerks came from the people who ran the stores. This was during an era when many of the downtown operations were locally owned. The owners and management knew their employees and customers and treated them as family. May Company was a very family-oriented company. I mean, even back in the 40s, when when because I, I saw the articles on it, back in the 40s when you come back from the from the war, uh, they would do interviews. They'd have parties for them. I mean, it was incredible. They recognized the importance of of uh, creating the right atmosphere for the employees. I mean, another good example is. Sam Halley, Walter Halley, Chiz Halley, all generations would be at the front door in the morning to greet employees when they came in. Um, when an employee was there 25 years, they were given $1,000 in a, a reception and had their family come in to meet their Halley family. The employees were so important. I don't care whether you were sweeping the floor or what you were doing, Sam Halley probably knew your name. <laughs>
as a family-owned store, they treated their employees like family, and they always told the employees that we should treat each customer as though they were a guest in our home. The downtown stores employed plenty of people to make that family work and make the guests feel welcome. They had 3,500 salespeople and in a building that was only six stories high, so you can imagine how many people were downtown. That's what's so remarkable about department stores is they provided employment for thousands and thousands of people, mostly women, who hadn't worked before. And that's one of the great social changes in American history, is as retailing grew, particularly department stores, women who had very limited opportunities to work in the late 19th century, uh, teachers or nurses, suddenly found another avenue open to them. Not that it was extremely uh, well-paying, but department stores, clerking in department stores. If you went to a department store, there was somebody behind every counter. There was immediate help. Halley's was a wonderful place to work. Once you worked at Halley's, and you were what I call Halleyized, you were marked for life. Um, because the experience I had at Halley's was an experience that taught me how to, how to live. This company puts no premiums on tricks or dishonesty. And when in doubt about making a decision, be honest and you'll never be wrong. People were kinder, they were more respectful of other people. Um, whether you were the customer or the salesperson, they um, tried to take very good care of you, let you know that they did appreciate your business. It was a people company. It, it was, uh, I guess it was the times. It was a time of streetcars, white gloves, window displays, and attentive clerks. All that together made shopping special. It was the way we shopped. Coming up next on The Way We Shopped, the best bargains in town, creaky escalators, delicious frosties, and great places to eat, like the Silver Grill. But first, take a moment to call WVIZ PBS with your pledge of financial support. Your donation will help WVIZ PBS continue to produce quality local programs like The Way We Shop. Part of the adventure of downtown shopping was the treasure hunt for great deals. Veteran shoppers took this challenge seriously. When we would go downtown, she was looking for bargains. So that meant we were going to go from one store to the next, to the next. Uh, she had already had uh, the articles in the paper, I guess, advertising. So she knew, uh, she had already, like a general, she had already mapped out her plan. We'd start our shopping trip starting at Mays, and we'd go all the way down the street, and we'd go, um, um, let's see, past Bonwit Teller, go down the basement, see if it had any deals. The first stop was always the Terminal Tower, the observation deck. Spend some time there. Then I guess it's Higby's. I always look around Higby's. Cross the street to Mays. And then head up Euclid and stop in every store just to look around. But occasionally, the genteel customs of the times were forgotten when there were bargains to be had. The bargain basement was, was quite an experience. It almost brings to mind the old movies where people would fight over the girdle and rip it in half or pull the sleeves out of uh, sweaters. And that's somewhat the way it was, just be like a couple days before Christmas and when they had the markdowns after Christmas. <laughs> When we had a big sale, we used to uh, see people there at 10 o'clock in the morning, outside the doors, ready, ready to come in and find bargains. I remember the May Day sales that we had. Uh, we didn't do any kind of work whatsoever on the floors because there'd be so many people in here, uh, and especially in the lower level. I mean, you couldn't even walk down there. There'd be clothing everywhere and you'd have people struggling over I want this I want that I mean it was tremendous sales back then I have memories of coming to downtown Cleveland as a youngster my mother would always uh, go on Tuesdays only because Tuesday was double stamp day at the May Company and Bailey Company 
Stamps were a way for stores to build customer loyalty, to keep you coming back. You were given stamps when you bought stuff, and when you saved up enough, you could come back, redeem your stamps, and get more stuff. Ego stamps, this was a sort of a bonus at May Company, and I think my mother shopped mostly at May Company so she could get the Eagle stamps. For every 10 cents you purchased, you were given a little Eagle stamp, and you had a book, and the book was worth $3. And my, when my mother would come home from shopping, she would hand over these Eagle stamps, and we kids would have to lick them and put them in a book. Green stamps, Eagle stamps, were my, my mother's passion, and she collected them. And, and I do recall that one time, 1953 or 54, she had filled an Eagle stamp book. Uh, I've been told this because I wasn't there with her. And she went to May Company, and what was she going to cash it in on? Well, it had a new building toy set called American Plastic Bricks, and, and she bought this for me. And as a kid, I became hooked on toy construction sets and, and American Plastic Bricks. Now, I think the irony of this is she got this for an Eagle stamp book, and today I've been trying to recapture my childhood, so I've been shopping for American plastic bricks on eBay. And fortunately, my mother's not around to hear how much I'm paying for the bloody bricks. One reason stamps used to be so popular was because money was tight and credit was hard to get. When charge cards were introduced, it was a real status symbol to have one. But the first one was not today's familiar plastic. It was the much coveted charger plate. Back in those days, we didn't have Visa or MasterCard. We had a, a charge plate that was made out of a soft kind of tin. I know my mother used to say, don't bend it. That's how soft it was. It was one um, metal charge plate, and each store had their own little notch. So depending on what store you went in, they had the, the machine and if it didn't fit in the notch, then you couldn't charge there. You use the same little, little metal thing about this big, and you only had to carry the one. For every store had its own little notch. My mother, my sister and I each had one, and it came in a um, sort of like a little leather case, and you carried it in your wallet, and you guarded it with your life. <laughs> the charger plates weren't the only piece of early technology that shoppers still recall. Take a tour around Dillard's downtown Cleveland store today, and you'll find these old clocks, where the lights below the clock face were part of an ingenious color-coded paging system for employees. If your combination of colored lights came on, well, the boss wanted to see you. Or check out these holes located near the high ceilings on the main floor. They're all that remain of yet another favorite memory. Like many department stores of old and specialty stores, they had what's called a tube system. Whereas when you purchase something, whether by cash or check or whatever form of payment you were using, there was a tube which they would take the end off of, insert the pertinent information, and send it via these tubes to a room of women who would take care of this, and then send it back your receipt in that tube. How the person, the cashier that did the, the money thing, how she knew how to get it back to the right spot, I never did figure out, but it got there. <laughs> it operated on the same concept used at bank drive throughs today. But each cashier station had its own tube, so hundreds of tubes went to clerks all over the store. The canisters were numbered, as were the tubes, so the people who were at Tube Central made change and usually got it back to the right clerk and customer. You'd put it in there and it would suck it up to some place, goodness knows where, and about two minutes later it would come back down and, and drop into a box and the person's change and receipt would be in there. And of course it did save on not having cash registers. Now, how did that work again? Just a nice brass canister that you twist open, put, put the change in there, put the dollar bills in there, fold them up, twist it shut lift the uh, top of the, uh, the dead end part of the tube, drop this in, canister goes through the tube, up into the office, they make change. They had the pneumatic tube and, uh, you, you know, you can still hear that sound that whoosh as it went off. There were interesting ways that people got around the stores as well. Moving from department to department was half the fun.